Many lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people have difficulty finding healthcare where they feel welcomed, included, and respected. In this video, you will hear from five people discussing the ups and downs of receiving healthcare. These stories show how assumptions, word choice, and body language can affect the quality of care a person receives. When I was growing up in rural Delaware, Ohio, um, my doctor never once talked about sexual health, never once talked about, um, asked me if I was a part of the LGBT community. Um, and I always, because of that, felt a little weird about asking him about that. But I just specifically remember when I came back from college, I told my doctor, yeah, um, you know, I really, I need to get HIV tests. I need to start getting STD tests. And he's like, was confused. Like, why do you need to start doing that? What, what do you, what's, why? Why do you need those tests? And I don't see any symptoms when you have any of this stuff. And I was like, well, I am a gay male and I understand that these things are things that I need to start talking about, thinking about, looking at. You know, it, it brought up all those different things that you know you think about when you're, um, when you kind of tell a doctor you need something and they feel like they don't think that you need it as well. So feeling invisible and those kind of things. In my later 20s, my partner and I decided we wanted to try to have a baby. Um, and we tried and we tried and we tried to no avail. We went to a specialist hoping that um, we could just begin to understand our options, recognizing that options for two women trying to have babies insurance-wise are a little bit more constricted than they are for heterosexual couples. And he um, began talking with me and um, completely and totally just focusing on me. Um, and my partner was sitting right next to me and he acted like she wasn't even there. So I continued to refer to her and us and we and our family that we're trying to create together and he just couldn't even look to acknowledge her presence, which was disturbing because <laughs> we were together trying to do this together. And he um, got more and more agitated as I was asking questions. Um, and at the height of it, just finally said, you know what, I can't give you any special treatment. And that was when we said, thank you very much, and left. It made me and us feel invisible. Even though he was looking at me, it made me feel like he's not seeing me at all. <laughs> he's not understanding what we're here to talk about. So I got the name of a physician that I thought would be a, a good fit for me, and I went in to my first uh, uh, office visit with him to establish care, and uh, I shared with him that I was gay right up, right up front, and that I had, had a partner that I'd been with for, at that time, maybe 10 years, and kind of went through the list. And um, it, it didn't, I, I got the impression he was uncomfortable. When it came time to take in a sexual history, one of the things that he said to me was, well, of course you're monogamous, and, and um, really kind of shut the conversation down. Not that, not that I was necessarily going to disclose everything about, but, but that, that judgment, that assumption um, of who I was and, and what I did in terms of behavior, and it really kind of made that the rest of that uh, interview kind of difficult because I felt like I couldn't really be honest with him now um, uh, because of these assumptions that he had kind of implied and made. And what I wanted to find was a provider that was, uh, uh, that understood the needs of a, of a gay male and, and was comfortable around uh, gay men. We probably could have arrived at um, an earlier intervention had he just kind of understood the needs of a gay man understood um, uh, culture and the, and the different uh, cultures and lifestyles that gay men might lead and, and ask questions in an open um, and inquisitive way rather than one in which I felt it wasn't safe to disclose personal information about myself for fear I was going to be judged. So really my first healthcare experience as a trans person was when I actually came out to like my first PCP and really kind of initiated that process of transition. And it was obviously terrifying. I had been with this PCP for four or five years at that point, and this was really the first step. From the get-go when I first said, you know, I'm interested in starting 
hormone treatment. And she said, well, why? You don't have any hormone imbalances or anything. I said, well, I'm transgender and I'd like to transition from female to male and I'd like to you know, use hormones for that. And she was like, oh, well, I've never done this before. I've never had a patient that I you know, initiated hormones with and took them through the transition process, but I'm more than willing to work with you um, and we can, we can really do this together. And that's what I really appreciated was the fact that she like acknowledged that she'd never done this before, but she wasn't scared to really educate herself and, and listen to what I wanted as well and kind of move this forward. It was very affirming in a lot of ways because there was never a question of like, are you sure this is how you identify? And she was very good about, you know, when they were relevant, she asked the questions that she needed to ask, but I don't feel like she was being, you know, overly invasive or just asking questions to satisfy her own curiosity. Um, it was very much like very patient-focused care that she gave me and just really, you know, wanting to make sure that I achieved the goals that I wanted to achieve, but helping me get there like safely. I have had providers in the past who have made some assumptions and it's, it's like, well, that's not really correct. And that you know, can affect healthcare. People think that if you're gonna go through the process of transitioning to male, obviously it's because you're attracted to females and that's not necessarily the case. And then also like recognizing that my journey is my own and not attributing all these other, you know, all these other health concerns that may be endemic to the trans population, but don't, may not apply to myself. So I um, grew up in the Midwest and I came out to my family in high school. Um, and I remember having a, a physical with my primary care provider and not being out to my parents at the time and being really nervous about her being the first adult that I might come out to and not feeling super close to her because um, I saw her probably once a year. Um, and her asking me if I'm sexually active and, say, and I said yes, because at the time I had started dating someone. Um, and then her asking, bringing up a conversation about birth control and understanding that that didn't apply to me and was this gonna be the moment where I um, kind of outed myself or was I just gonna answer the questions and say no, um, knowing that if I had done that, she would have probably kept pushing me for the answers. And so I did come out to her and I was really nervous. I think I probably stuttered over my words and didn't feel very confident about it. And when I kept coming back to her each year, she kind of kept bringing that birth control question back up, which I remember feeling um, kind of angry about or misunderstood. So I almost felt pushed backwards a little bit, I think, in thinking about, have I not really figured this out about myself or is this something I should just start on and is this what good healthcare looks like if you're a young woman? Um, and so having to just kind of reassert myself and um, be really authoritative with her was uncomfortable as a young person to a kind of much older provider who had known me for a long time. I think she could have just asked, Julian, I know you're dating women exclusively at this point in your life. I think that's wonderful. I'm so happy that you're in a home that um, has been accepting of that. If your situation changes, if you know, your identity changes or how you're feeling changes, if your behaviors change, let's talk about birth control, or you know that you could always bring that back up with me, but I'm not gonna bring it back up because I understand what you've told me about yourself. Now that we are a family of four, um, we often will go to appointments all together. When my children were in preschool, and at that point we had explained to them how they were created, the donor concept and what that all meant and what it meant to be kids from a two-mom family and how to explain that to their friends as they started school. Um, and we had noticed some signs that my son might have had a genetic um, illness that might get more challenging as he grew older, so we were referred to a genetic specialist. And this person immediately started saying, and the father, and the father, and the dad, and the dad, and the father, and the father, and it was, you know, and I kept saying, donor, donor back, <laughs> and they kept saying, father, father. And our kids are getting more and more like bewildered, wondering, what are these people talking about? I thought we had this conversation about how our family came to be, and we understand this donor thing, but, why is this person saying that we have a dad? And it was just really, really overwhelming and confusing. So it makes us invisible and it's, it's also very confusing and upsetting to the kids um, when they're not acknowledged and they don't understand it in the way that we do. So I think that that's, that's a, a big thing, just making us um, know that you see us and acknowledge us and Ask questions if you need to. You know, the question we started with, what are your pronouns? Like, that's a really important question. How do you identify? Those are important questions so that a provider can then get the language that the people sitting in front of them use so that they can then use that moving forward.